For many, the act of getting married is a never-ending promise of love and commitment. This is, sadly, not the case for everyone. There are many things that motivate one to kill their spouses, such as a new love interest, money, or even a fear of losing them or any children they share. But regardless, to most of us, these reasonings cannot justify the actions that have been carried out. In today's episode, we'll be looking at three cases of matricide, wives that murder their husbands. Pamela Smart Pamela Ann Wojas was born in Florida on August 16th, 1967. She was just 19 years old when she met Gregory Smart at a New Year's Eve party in 1986, where the pair bonded over their shared love of heavy metal music. By February 1987, the couple had formed a relationship and just two years later, they were married. However, cracks soon began to show in the couple's relationship, with problems arising just seven months after they were married. Pamela met 15-year-old William Billy Flynn at a local drug awareness program, where they both volunteered. She was 22 at the time, it's unknown what conversation took place between Billy and Pamela, who bonded, like she and her husband did, over their enjoyment of heavy metal music, and entered into an affair. But, at some point, the plan was hatched. The plan to kill Gregory Smart. On May 1st, 1990, Pamela came home from work to find her house ransacked and her husband murdered in cold blood. It seemed clear from the get-go that Gregory had disturbed a robbery in progress and had been shot for it. But all was not as it seemed, and on the ball detectives soon found out about the affair between Pamela and Billy, and Pamela was accused of seducing the 15-year-old and threatening to withhold sex from him until he killed her husband. Billy took along friends to help him carry out his task, Patrick Randall, Vance Latine Jr. and Raymond Fowler. During the police's investigation, the father of Vance brought a 38 caliber weapon he'd found in the house to them, suspecting it could be the murder weapon. On May 14th, an anonymous tip came into the police department, which alerted them to the fact that another teenager, who volunteered at the same drug awareness program where Billy and Pamela had met, was aware of the plan. She was also friends with both Billy and Pamela, a girl named Cecilia Pierce. When police approached Cecilia, they asked her if she would wear a wire for them so they could record her conversations with Pamela Smart. Cecilia agreed. At some point over the next few months, the 22-year-old incriminated herself as the police were hoping, but details on what exactly Pamela said are unknown. On August 1st, 1990, at 1.05 p.m., Pamela Smart was arrested for the murder of her husband, Gregory. The trial of real-life femme fatale Pamela Smart garnered masses of attention from the public and the media. The teenagers who had carried out the killing on her behalf had already secured their own plea bargains and were prepared to testify against the woman who turned their lives around for the worst. Pamela's trial began on March 4th, 1991. She was described by the prosecutors as an evil woman bent on murder and the mastermind behind the murder plot, while the four teenage boys she had ensnared in her plan were portrayed as naive victims, wooed by the charms of an older woman. According to the Assistant Attorney General, Pamela seduced Billy to murder Gregory so that she could avoid a pricey divorce and collect $140,000 worth of life insurance policy money. 
despite the fact that Billy was a minor, which meant their relationship was cause for concern in itself, Pamela admitted freely to the affair, but denied being the one who came up with the idea to kill her husband. She claimed she had no part in the plot to murder, and that Billy and his friends decided to do it when Pamela made the decision to put an end to the affair. Pamela's trial lasted 14 days and ended on March 22nd, 1991. She was found guilty of being an accomplice to murder, witness tampering, and conspiracy to commit murder. She was charged for the crime of witness tampering because she tried to get Cecilia Pierce to not say anything to authorities about the plot. Pamela was sentenced to life without parole. Since her imprisonment, she has been subject to beatings from other prisoners and has alleged that she and another inmate were sexually harassed and assaulted by a corrections officer. She also tried to file a lawsuit against the prison after claiming that half-naked photos of her published in the National Enquirer in 2003 were taken by a prison guard who had raped her. Pamela has attended counseling, tutored other prisoners, and gained a master's degree from Mercy College while she has been imprisoned. Billy Flynn was sentenced to life for second degree murder in 1992, but he was released in 2015 with lifetime parole. Patrick Randall also received lifetime parole in 2015, while the two other boys involved in the case were paroled in 2005. As of 2020, Pamela Smarts has been denied a sentence reduction hearing. This was her second attempt to get a hearing. She is now 52 years old and continues to protest her innocence. Susan Wright Born in Houston, Texas on April 24th, 1976, Susan Lucille Weish was by all accounts, a seemingly ordinary woman. That is, until 2003, when she became known as the blue-eyed butcher of the Houston suburbs. In 1979, Susan met Jeff Wright while she had been working as a waitress at a restaurant, and in 1998, the pair married while she was eight and a half months pregnant with the couple's first son, Bradley. Just four years later, in 2002, their daughter, Kaylee, was born. According to Susan, she first began to experience domestic violence and abuse at the hands of Jeff during the first few years of their marriage. He reportedly became controlling around the time of Bradley's birth. But in 2003, things escalated, and something inside of Susan seemed to snap. On January 18th, Susan admitted to her lawyer that she had killed Jeff. In turn, her attorney reported this to the police, and the then 26-year-old turned herself in. When police investigated the family home in Harris County, Texas, they were met with clues that painted an extremely grisly scene. On January 13th, 2003, Susan tied her husband, Jeff, 34 at the time, to their bed and stabbed him 193 times with two different knives. She then buried his body in their backyard before painting the bedroom to cover up the crime. The next day, she filed a false domestic violence report so that she could have a restraining order filed against Jeff. Four days later, she confessed to her lawyer. Susan Wright's trial began on February 24th, 2004, where she pleaded not guilty by way of self-defense. The prosecutor described Susan as a scheming wife who carried out the gruesome crime so that she could collect $200,000 in life insurance for her husband's death, while the defense argued that she had suffered physical and emotional abuse for years and was protecting both herself and her children. Reportedly, Jeff had come home from a boxing class and hit his son after attempting to get Bradley to box with him. Susan testified in her own defense, claiming that she couldn't stop stabbing Jeff, because if she did, he'd grab the knife and kill her. She told the court that her husband had been on a cocaine binge and had beaten her after his encounter with Bradley. 
Susan's own mother, amongst others, although it is unclear who, stated that they had seen the 26-year-old covered in bruises. However, the jury did not seem to believe anything that Susan and her defense team were saying. On March 3rd, 2004, after more than five hours of deliberation, the jury returned a guilty verdict. Susan was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Susan Wright spent much of the following years trying to appeal her conviction. During such an appeal in 2008, an ex-fiance of Jeff's came forward to claim that he had been violent with her and she had endured his abuse for the entire four-year relationship they had shared. In 2009, the Texas Court of Criminal Appears granted a new sentencing hearing as they deemed that her counsel had proved to be ineffective during the punishment phase of the trial in 2004. The new hearing in 2010 saw some fresh evidence come to light. The prosecutor's theory that Jeff was tied to the bed was not supported by the medical examiner who dug up the body. According to them, Jeff had had so much cocaine that it hadn't all been metabolized, which supported the defense's theory that he was intoxicated that night. The medical examiner also stated that Jeff had several wounds to his hands, forearms, back, and the backs of his legs, injuries that are inconsistent with the idea that he had been tied down at the wrists and ankles to the bed. Although Jeff was found with bindings around his wrists and ankles, it's been theorized that this is how Susan maneuvered her husband to his grave, although it seems that no one truly knows with complete certainty. In an interview with Texas Monthly, Susan admitted to tying one of her husband's arms to the bed when, during the frenzied attack, her son had knocked on their bedroom door. She tied Jeff to the bed before walking Bradley back to his room. Allegedly, during the attack, Jeff had raped Susan before attempting to stab her, and so she stabbed him multiple times before he could. Reportedly, no psychologists or domestic violence experts were ever called to the stand during the 2004 trial of Susan Wright. After her new punishment hearing, Susan's sentencing was reduced from 25 years to 20 years. She was denied parole in 2014 and 2017 and is now eligible for parole once again in 2020. Catherine Knight. Catherine Mary Knight, born October 25th, 1955 in New South Wales, Australia, did not have the easiest of upbringings. Her father, Ken Knight, was an alcoholic. He'd had an affair with Catherine's mother, Barbara, which had caused the family to uproot to a new town. Ken used violence and intimidation to rape Barbara, who told her daughters details of the abuse and how much she despised men. Catherine herself frequently fell victim to sexual abuse by other family members, although never by her father. This reportedly ended when she was 11 years old. During her childhood, Catherine was described as a loner who bullied smaller children. She had two major run-ins at school, where she had assaulted at least one boy and was injured by a teacher who had been acting in self-defense. Oddly, despite this less than savory behavior, she was still otherwise considered a good pupil. She left school at 15, still illiterate, and received her first job as a cutter in a clothing factory. 12 months later, she moved on to work at a slaughterhouse and was quickly promoted. She considered this her dream job, and was given her own set of butcher's knives, which she hung proudly above her bed. In 1973, when Catherine was 18, she met a hard-drinking co-worker by the name of David Stanford Kellett. His heavy drinking habits stemmed from the fact that he'd seen his best friend killed in front of him, and also from an accident which involved six dead children, where he'd helped to rescue the injured and retrieve the lifeless bodies. The pair married a year later, in 1974, where Catherine's mother, Barbara, told her new husband that he had a screw loose somewhere, claiming that one day, her daughter would kill him. 
On their wedding night, Catherine attempted to strangle David as he'd fallen asleep after they'd made love three times. However, this was just the beginning of the turbulent, violent marriage. On one occasion, while she was heavily pregnant, Catherine burned all of his clothes and shoes before hitting David over the back of the head with a frying pan because he'd come home late. This resulted in him gaining a fractured skull, and he ran to a neighbor for help. Somehow though, the new bride managed to talk David into dropping the charges against her. In May 1976, after the birth of the couple's first child, a daughter named Melissa, David left Catherine for another woman. The next day, as she pushed Melissa's pram down the street, she violently threw it from side to side. Witnesses who saw the incident taking place alerted authorities, and Catherine was admitted to hospital, where she was diagnosed with postnatal depression. After several weeks, she left the hospital of her own volition and then went and left Melissa, just barely two months old, on a railway line. Thankfully, the child was rescued. Meanwhile, Catherine stole an axe and threatened to kill several people in town and was again arrested and taken to hospital and, incredibly, was allowed to sign herself out the next day. Several days passed, but Catherine wasn't done with her aggressive, violent rampage. She slashed the face of a woman with a knife and demanded that she take her to Queensland to find David. The woman escaped at a service station, but when police arrived, Catherine had taken a little boy hostage. She was disarmed and, once again, admitted to hospital. When police informed David of his estranged wife's antics, he left his girlfriend and moved in with his mother so that he could support Catherine and Melissa. Catherine was released in August 1976 from the psychiatric hospital she had been staying in and was placed into the care of David and her mother-in-law. On March 6th, 1980, the couple had their second child, another daughter named Natasha. Four years later, Catherine left her first husband and returned to work at the slaughterhouse. Shortly after, she injured her back and ended up on a disability pension. She was given housing by the governments that same year in 1985. Following the breakup with David, Catherine went on to have a string of affairs. David Saunders, a 38-year-old minor, was her first new partner in 1986. Catherine would often throw him out, and in 1987, she cut the throat of his dingo puppy as a demonstration of what would happen to him if he ever cheated on her. The pair had a daughter in 1988, Sarah, and then went on to put a deposit down on a house. After an argument, however, Catherine ended up hitting David in the face with an iron before stabbing him in the stomach with scissors. Understandably, David left and went into hiding when he found out that Catherine had cut up all his clothing. Upon returning to see his daughter, he found out that Catherine had been issued an apprehended violence order from the police after claiming that she was afraid of him. In 1990, Catherine was impregnated by her 43-year-old former co-worker, John Chillingworth. The pair had a son named Eric. Three years later, however, Catherine left him for another man with whom she'd been having an affair with, John Price. Price was the same age as Catherine, and his previous marriage had ended in 1988, leaving him with three children. He was well-liked by those who knew him and had a good reputation in the town. His youngest child, a two-year-old daughter, remained with his ex-wife, while the older children stayed with him. Reportedly, John knew of Catherine's violent reputation as he carried out his affair with her, and even as he moved her into his home in 1995. His children liked her and their relationship was good, except for the odd, violent argument for a while. In 1998, the couple fought as John refused to marry Catherine. In retaliation, Catherine videoed items that he had stolen from work and sent the recording to his boss. Although the items were expired objects that John had salvaged from the rubbish tip, he was fired after 17 years of service. As a result, Catherine was kicked out of the family home that John shared with his children. A few months later, John restarted his relationship with Catherine 
but would not let her move in. The couple's fights became more frequent, and John's friends wanted nothing to do with him while the relationship lasted. In February of 2000, things escalated extensively. Catherine stabbed John in the chest and, once again, was kicked out of the house. He got a restraining order for him and his children and told his co-workers that if he didn't show up, it was because Catherine had murdered him. Catherine showed up at John's house on the 29th, having sent his children away to a sleepover. He spent much of the evening with neighbors before returning home, which is when Catherine appeared. The pair had sex and afterwards, John fell asleep. The next day, at 6 a.m., a neighbor of John's saw his car in the drive. John did not show up to work. A co-worker was sent to check on him, and when they received no answer at the front door, they phoned police, who arrived at 8 a.m. and broke down the door to find Catherine comatose from an overdose of pills. It was found that she had stabbed her partner using a butcher's knife as he slept. When he awoke, she chased him around the house. Once he had bled out, she withdrew $1,000 from his ATM account. In total, Catherine had stabbed John at least 37 times, with many wounds rupturing his vital organs. Several hours after John's death, Catherine had skinned him and hung the flesh from a meat hook. She also decapitated him and cooked parts of his body, serving it with baked potato and various roasted vegetables, finishing this grisly meal with gravy. She put the plates in two table settings, one for each of the children who lived with John. Catherine Knight had every intention of feeding the children their own father. John's head was found in a pot with vegetables. It was still warm, indicating that the cooking had taken place recently. She had arranged John's remaining body with an arm over a soft drink bottle and his legs crossed. A handwritten note was left on top of a photo with him, which implied that Price was molesting one of Catherine's daughters. These accusations were found to be groundless. Two psychiatrists claimed that Catherine suffered from a borderline personality disorder. Whilst many found her to be sane, although some thought that she was suffering from amnesia or disassociation. She initially entered a plea of guilty to manslaughter, which was rejected, and so she changed her plea to guilty, although she still denies any responsibility for her actions. Catherine's trial took place on October 15, 2001. At her sentencing, it was refused that she be excused from hearing some of the facts. She became hysterical and had to be sedated when the skinning and decapitation was described. On November 8th, 2001, Catherine's papers were marked never to be released, and she was sentenced to life imprisonment. This was the first time in Australian history that this ruling had been imposed on a woman. She has since been dubbed Cannibal Cathy and Australia's Hannibal Lecter. In 2006, Catherine appealed the life sentence, claiming it was too severe for the brutal killing she carried out. This was, understandably, refused. Strangely, Catherine Knight has adjusted well to life in prison and reportedly has a very good reputation behind bars. She is referred to as Nana and is described as being caring and maternal. She frequently knits and paints, is extremely devout, and is known for sorting disputes among inmates. Despite this, the gruesome and vile crime she carried out will haunt the family and friends of John Price and herself forever. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your thoughts on these terrifying cases. And remember to like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.